Good morning and thanks for having me uh, for this workshop. I'll jump right in to cover what I have to say. Today I'm gonna first position interactive learning system on a two by two matrix to make my arguments and then develop a live demo of a self-calibrating interface. Show how it was applied to brain computer interface and then go back to my positioning to explain a few challenges I think um, might be interesting for the community. So my positioning start with on the x-axis, on the side, you have an interaction system where the user has to learn how to use it. It's kind of, I want to teach a machine, but the interface to use it, I have to learn it as a user. And on the other side is more, I start teaching the machine how I want, and the machine that has to figure out the way I decide to interact with them. And so there is a, definitely a challenge, because people like are different, and so you need to learn. And in the middle, there is always co-adaptation, where it's always kind of a bit of both. On the y-axis, I want to have a scale of usability in terms of timing. So can I use it right now? Can it work like right now? Or do I have to up through a series of steps until we kind of converge to either I learn how to use it and it takes me some time, or the machine learns to understand me, but it takes the machine some time. And I'll position a few systems, try to understand, make some sort of experiments to justify what a self-calibrating interface might, why it might be. So some examples on the top left, you have classic an app where it's easy to use. The user just learns how to you know, use an app, but it's made to be used immediately. In the middle, you have something a bit more complex, like a remote control, where you have a few buttons that you don't really know what they mean, you need to learn. And the extreme case is like a cockpit of a plane where you take years, literally years, to learn to use it. On the right-hand side, so that's all the user has to learn. On the right-hand side, where the machine has to learn, you have more like a brain-computer interface, uh, where it's very easy to, um, to drive a wheelchair to understand how, how the wheelchair works, but you, the machine needs to understand how your brain works. Right? It needs to understand how you're going to say to him, go forwards or go backwards, and that's different for you and for me, and it takes quite a lot of time to calibrate. So we're in that corner, and, and I want also to sp specify that not all machine learning is on the right side, right? Any interface that has a pre-trained machine learning model that has been trained on millions of data of everyone and uses like something we have as a shared experience, like language, like English. So if you take an Alexa and you speak in English, everybody can use it, right? There's no need for the machine to relearn how you specifically speak. And if, any, if anything, you have to learn what are the important keywords. So that would be more on the left side. And we can debate this, but let, let's follow my sort of experiments here. And then if you want to be in co-adaptation, a bit in the middle, you kind of bring elements from what we've just found. And you have example like GloveTalk, for that I know, which, which can both start from search and then adapts to the user. And that's it. So if, if, if we follow this logic, we can reach anything within this triangle. And I want to go a bit deeper in that to show that there is some sort of, as an assumption I'm making, there's some sort of underlying ideality of how this space looks like. So if we take a device like the TV and a remote control with buttons, we could do some experiments, user experiments. We could go and see experiments and ask them, um, what do you think of this device? So we build one and we ask them, is it, do you like it? Is it efficient or is it hard to use? One such device could be a remote control with very simple, just directional control and a confirm button and they'll use it for a while, it would be really easy to use immediately, but in terms of power, uh, it would be limited because there's some function that uh, will be really cumbersome to find and, and use, it will take many clicks. On the other extreme, you have a remote control with every button possible for everything the TV can do, and that would be cumbersome because you'd have a very steep learning curve to use this. On the right-hand side, you'd have a blank remote control where you'd be asked to tell what every button is supposed to do. So it comes totally blank state and you program it yourself. That would be really cumbersome, of course, because then you can't really start using it before a certain time. And on the top right is something a bit more evasive that we are not used to, and I hope to show you a demo of what this might be later today. And that would be a device with just two buttons where you just start using it. You don't know what the buttons are supposed to do, <laughs> but as you use it, the machine learns what you want to do and, and kind of does it. 
and 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 you know it would adapt like you and me would have the same remote but it would not work the same way if i take your remote i would not be able to use it because it's tailored to you and then you have the normal remote which what you know designers have converged with and it's it's more efficient because it's a bit of, of mix of the you have some quick button access button and some buttons you can program maybe and 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 some of them are more tailored to what people do most of the time just have been better engineers and people like it better and so if we follow that, we could maybe build all these millions of devices that are fine grained into the scale, do the experiments and have an ideality map underneath, right? And then there is questions like, what well, does an optimal mapping exist, right? Is there anything that we would all like to be using? I think the answer is no, but what, what most startup people would tell you is that it's a top left corner. Like, okay, we want user, you want something fixed that user can learn immediately and is very efficient. And that's what people target, convenience corner. And I think it's nice, it's a nice target to get when it's feasible. I don't think it's always feasible, but I think it's especially only working for modalities that are consciously in control, right? That are explicit, and we'll go to the implicit part just now, especially speech or touch or gestures where if, I, if you ask me to wave, I know how to wave. If you ask me to say hello, I know how to say hello. I don't have to learn how to do it, and I know what I'm doing. On the other end, you have interfaces like neural interfaces. That's one subsample of interface we don't know, right? If you ask me to generate specific spikes on specific neurons, I won't know how to do this. Or specific patterns on my muscles inputs, I won't know how to do it exactly. And those are cases where I do think the underlying ideality map is more like this. Right? It's more like, obviously you want it as you can higher up as you can, so you can use it quickly. Uh, but you do need to adapt to every person because every person is different. And you also do want to be able to use it somehow out of the box. So the user still needs to kind of learn how to use it. Um, so we are more there. And of course, right now we are more in the bottom right in terms of what exists. And, and the question is, how do we get there, right? How do we get toward this? Some answers are like what a lot of people are working on is pre-trained average decoders. So you learn some sort of average based decoder that works for on average data you collected on millions of people, you train the coder and then you fine tune for that specific person through maybe an onboarding stage. That works, okay, that works quite well. But the question is how, you know, as a scientist, as a curious person, how can we go further than this? Because sometimes a pre-train just won't work, right? Just some people have opposite way to use it. People use the mouse scrolling up to go down or down to go up, or, you know, people have just inherently different ways to approach problems. And the question then is, where is this Where is this other corner that I've not touched yet? And I don't have the clear answer of what that is. I don't have a clear example. Um, but I know that from work I've done and, and work I've seen, that it has to do with some sort of measure of users' internal consistency. And that means that one definition that you could think of is that users perform similar actions to mean similar things. They are somehow internally consistent with themselves, like they have a mental model of what to do and they do it in repetition. And another definition of consistency is by defining the opposite of like being a lack of contradiction. It's like users more likely won't contradict themselves. That's something that can be debated and I know we have interesting talks today on this topic, but, but I, I wanna stick with that for a minute and, and show you how this has been put to use recently in different works. And I selected four works that I've put in the corner they're all really on the same spirit. First one is called First Contact. It's been last year in RIPS. And what they did is they, they really tried to control a rover with your hand. So you have a controller between how you move your hands and how this rover move. And they evolved this controller, but without a reward function that is explicit on the task, right? Without saying, we're gonna evolve the best controller so the lander doesn't crash now. They said, we're gonna evolve the best controller so that we're going to maximize mutual information between the movement that the user is doing and the kind of state transition the movement of this rover. And that is to say that if I'm doing, if the rover is behaving like I want it to do, I'm gonna act consistently with it, right? Like when I do something, I won't keep just changing all the time what I'm doing because it will do what I expect it to do. And, and sure enough, they did that and, and it worked. Like they, they did have to give them a task to test 
but it was not incentivized on that task and they could successfully land the rover about 50% of the time, which is great improvement from baseline. Second work is the architecture builder problem, 2021, that I think has been published also ICML or another similar conference, where you have an architect and a builder, and there they kind of simulated both sides. You have the teacher and the learner in the room, but they only can communicate through unknown signals, right? So they don't know what the signal means, and all they could rely on is some sort of other metrics, like some sort of internal consistency. It's hard to analyze what was going on, because it was a setup that was incentivized at a level that, that that's not that explicit but if you go and look into the supplementary materials they have a figure um, that shows the evolution of mutual information and the observation is that mutual information increases which makes sense but that could have been the target maybe of, of what they are doing like the other work did then we have interaction grounded learning which is a work of microsoft research and and i think paul is talking today on, which might explain this further. I'll be honest, that I, it's a very technical paper, a lot of math. I, I do understand what's going on. So you have a task that is, you have a number, you think of a number, we show you a number, and we want to know if it's the number you were thinking about. And, and, and we know that when it's not the number you were thinking about, there would be some sort of mismatch judgment signal in the brain, and we want to know what it means, but we, we don't have an explicit way to know that, right? There is never a button that says that tells you what you are supposed to think. And they solve this with some contrastive learning. And the contrastive learning idea is really to say, to pull apart, like find a lack of consistency, like find things that comes together and identify some pattern and then might run into symmetry issues. That's quite technical. But they solve this problem again without any calibration, without any reward signals. That is known, that is. And then we have work on self-calibration. That's my work and work I've done previously. So with Pierre, that's probably in the audience today and other people you might know. And I have different setup, but in that case, it's mostly trying to get somewhere on a map or trying to type a specific number, your specific target, and you do a turn taking with the machine to get where you want to go or to write what you want to type. So it's a slightly different setting than the other before. It's more turn taking. And the way we solve this is to find, we have a set of hypotheses of what you might try to do, and we, the way we print out without having an explicit ground truth is to identify what's a more consistent classifier, which is what, in a way, what, where is a lack of contradiction. And that's why I want to demo you. I define a self-calibrating interface as one that can identify users' intent without knowing how to classify their behavior. So there's a paper on archive that really does walk through on how this works. And there's a lot of demo online where you can try it at home. So if you're curious, do have a look. I'm going to run you through the interface. It's a very simple interface where you type a code on top. You have numbers displayed, but you don't click on them. They're just for information. And the machine just display information, which is a color. And you vote. If you type a one, you want to vote for it's yellow, like you tell him it's a yellow. And the way it works is you, if you want to enter the first digit, Inside the machine, all digits are possible. The machine shows you color on the digits. You vote, you say yellow, and so we can say it's not the gray one. So we can update the model of which one there is, and we refine this further step by step by changing the coloring according to what we know, and slowly we can get to one answer. Okay? That's how it works when we know what the button means. Of course, that's, that's where the challenge is. I'll do a demo just to make sure we agree and we align of how this works. I'm going to type a two, and I'm going to do gray, gray, yellow. Just type the two. If I want to type a six, six is gray, I do gray, yellow, I'm looking at six, gray, gray, and I'm just typed a six. So that's how the interface works. And that's the easy bit, it's pre-calibrated. Right? So we know what the button means. So where is the self-calibration park in there? Well, what you have to do is you have to remove one of the information, which is what does those, those button means. So when I'm talking to you, I need to not know exactly what you're saying. So I remove the color on the buttons. And I'll go even one step further. I'll not even use buttons. I just let you draw something. And so imagine that for yellow, you want to draw a cross, and for gray, you want to draw a circle. But you're free to do that because that's on the premises. I don't have to know in advance what you use. So maybe you'll use a Y for yellow and a G for gray. 
maybe you use a gray, a G for yellow and a Y for gray, because that's what you want to do, or, you know, or whatever. You can do whatever you want. And that's what self-calibration is, is you can start using it, you don't know what it is, and the machine will still figure out both what you're trying to do and how you're trying to do it. Let's do it. That's the interface, you can try it online. I'm going to do, I don't know, I'm going to do type one, and I'm gonna do a cross for gray, right? So one is gray, I'm doing a cross, and for yellow, I'm doing do a circle. I'm doing a yellow, and I'm gonna do a circle. One is yellow, I'm gonna do a circle. One is gray, I'm gonna do a cross. One is yellow, I'm gonna do a circle. And obviously, you see how my circles are imperfect, but it doesn't matter. My gray are crosses, I'm confident, and it worked. I just typed one, what I told you I was about to do, and look at what the machine found out. The machine found out that I was doing crosses for gray and circle for yellow. That's kind of magic, I invite you to read the paper. I'm gonna do it once more, different sign. I'm gonna do a seven, I'm gonna do a J, G for gray and Y for yellow, just for remember it. Seven is yellow, I'm doing a Y. It's yellow, I'm doing a Y. I'm looking at seven, I'm doing a G. I'm looking at seven, I'm doing a G. I'm looking at seven, I'm doing a G. It's gray. I'm looking at seven, it's yellow. I'm looking at seven, it's yellow. I'm looking at seven, it's gray. We'll get there. I'm doing at seven, it's a gray. Seven, it's yellow. It takes a bit more time. I'm not saying it's a ultimate interface yet, but look, I've just typed a seven, which is a different number than before. I'm not cheating. And I use different, the same interface, different ways to express what I wanted to say and the machine understood both. So that is getting closer to what the top right corner is. If you're interested, I have very nice visual tutorials available online if you read that paper or ask me. That explains you how this works. That is what we apply to brain-computer interfaces, so compl more complex problems. Uh, we have a paper on simulated data from 2014, and we have a paper on real data from 2015 that shows you that it works live with users and in real time. So what is this telling us? It's telling us that, yes, I think with recent work, we can get a bit closer to this part on the top uh, right corner. On one side, people have tried to maximize mutual information. On the other, people have tried to identify most coherent hypothesis by sorting out consistency. I'll have a look at those papers to get a, an idea of what that is. But but I think there is still a limit, right? On one side, on one side, it takes time. It's just slow because we have to go through the process of iterating to find the best hypothesis, right? Like one hypothesis at a time because that's what we display. We have to interact with it, so it's slow, right? So really, those are probably a bit slower, like a bit lower on the scale. But on the other side, we have somebody that. There's no direct control, like you're kind of doing a back and forth, you're just reacting to what's happening, you're not in control, really. And that is not also, that's not really natural, right? That's that's a limit to how immediately usable it is, because you have to go through this turn taking, and you cannot, you know, the machine has to wait that it understands to actually do something, right? The digit is not shown after a few steps, it takes time, which, in a way, it makes sense, it's a hard problem, but could we do better? Could we do better? So well, how, how do we get here and that's my challenge for the community and to conclude i want to say that what's next for me is that i'm trying to work on emg signals on this nice sensor or these dry electrodes i'm trying to use that to do a direct control task and i have some partnerships already in place with imperial college on new like innovative mathematical methods to analyze those data that might make it easier for the downstream self-calibration task. And if you're in the room and are interested in this as an industrial partner or an academic partner, please do reach out. My contacts are here. And if you want a feedback on this talk, there is also a feedback form or get in touch. Thank you.